This video is part, whatever, of a series on countries and nationalism. I've met a lot of people around the world, and quite a few of them have told me, I think my country needs a strong leader, like a dictator. I've always been fascinated with this belief, and I think now I can explain where it's coming from. The short answer is, the strong leaders told them to think that way. But how? How are we conditioned to believe we need people to tell millions of other people what they're not allowed to do? I'm Chris, and welcome back to my den of iniquity. I think this topic is pretty relevant today. We like to think we live under a robust democracy, but we're always just one election or coup away from dictatorship. We like to think we're too smart to fall prey to demagogues, but history shows half of us aren't. They tend to come to power in a crisis, and in case you hadn't noticed, you're in one. From the book Strongmen, for 100 years, charismatic leaders have found favorite moments of uncertainty and transition. Often coming from outside the political system, they create new movements, forge new alliances, and communicate with their followers in original ways. Authoritarians hold appeal when society is polarized or divided into two opposing ideological camps, which is why they do all they can to exacerbate strife. Periods of progress in gender, labor, or racial emancipation have also been fertile terrain for openly racist and sexist aspirants to office who soothe fears of the loss of male domination and class privilege and the end of white Christian civilization. Cultural conservatives have repeatedly gravitated to anti-democratic politics at such junctures of history, enabling dangerous individuals to enter mainstream politics and gain control of government. I hope all that sounded familiar. Let's try to understand why we come to want to follow leaders in the first place, and why we want them to be strong. One of the main justifications for the state or government is to protect the people it rules and impose order. Many people familiar with violent disorder say they'd rather live under dictatorship than chaos. Thomas Hobbes was one such person. He wrote the book Leviathan from that point of view about 400 years ago, and his ghost still haunts us. Writing during the English Civil War, Hobbes thought the only thing that would stop us from going to war with everyone was a powerful state. The state would have one or a few strong leaders who had full authority to impose order in the name of ensuring everyone's safety, on the one hand, but will be a commonwealth based on everyone's consent on the other. That's not a contradiction? No, no, all right. Okay. The assumptions are, first, enough force to intimidate everyone into complying leads to the creation of an ideal order where no one would dare misbehave. And second, the inevitable result of having no absolutist power to keep us in check is chaos. We're bad and can't be trusted with freedom. However, we need to understand our limited point of view as people growing up in the modern nation-state. Rule by an all-powerful authority is the norm. It's what we're all brought up to believe in. It's the first and sometimes last question we ask. What does authority say we can and can't do? So we never get the chance to govern ourselves. Someone else always has to rule us. The idea of freedom to govern ourselves as equals is never considered an option or is treated as obviously the war of all against all that Hobbes worried about. There's this popular idea of human nature as being evil and unsympathetic, when we tend to be thinking of people acting in artificial or extreme conditions, the exceptions rather than the rule. It's like assuming rats act the same in a laboratory as they do in the wild. I've made a whole series on this topic, so I won't go much deeper here, but suffice it to say, given the chance to organize together as equals without killing each other, we're actually really good at it. 
One reason people give me for their country needing a strong leader is the country has many diverse elements in it. Many different people with different languages and cultures and values, and the only thing that could hold them together is a strong central government. My problem is with thinking you have to hold them together. Why is the solution to people who don't want to be in political association with each other more force to keep them together, rather than simply the freedom to associate and organize how they want? Who taught us to think that way? We've been told all our lives, countries are there to protect us. So presumably the stronger it is, whatever that means, the better it protects you. However, to all intents and purposes, a country is a set of institutions that exist to oppress you and divide you from everyone else in the world, as I explained in part one. And being stronger usually means more power to the state to impose its laws. But if you've been brought up to identify with a country, a country is just family you haven't met. Its leaders are your parents, punishing you when you screw up, but only out of love, only for the sake of the country as a whole. I've looked at the idea of leadership in another video, which I link to in the description, but to sum it up, it's voluntary to follow leaders and involuntary to follow the dictates of the state. They're not leaders, but rulers. In fact, calling a statesperson a great leader is meaningless because we have no standards for leadership. But leader sounds better than ruler, so that's the word they've adopted. We're your leaders, and the country is a team or a family, and we're all in the same boat heading in the same direction. But a country isn't a team. We haven't even agreed what game we're playing or what the rules are. If we were on the same team, I would get some say in how institutions are run. If we were a family, I would get some of your wealth. But in a hierarchical society, authority makes the decisions for all of us and controls all the wealth. Some people think having rulers is inevitable. If you take a narrow enough view of history, say the written history of the past 10,000 years, it certainly looks like history is just a long line of tyrants. But that's because we have such a limited perspective on things. If you look within the cracks where history doesn't write as much about, you find these leaders were forced on people with no need of leaders. That leaders and their dictates have always been resisted. And they've always resorted to force to put down revolt. You find billions of people whose lives are only ruined by their so-called leaders because they're not leaders, but dictators, owners, and overseers. Prehistoric and tribal people tend not to have the strong leader, and in fact are often suspicious of anyone who tries to elevate themselves in any way above others. For example, if one hunter is clearly superior to others, they expect that hunter to be humble. And if they aren't humble, they get teased until they're humbled. Some groups have leaders just during hunting season, and then no leader the rest of the time. And the, if the hunting leader tried to stay on and give orders, the others wouldn't listen. But having lost all perspective on human prehistory, the only world we know is one of hierarchy and oppression. The only ideas we have are more power for the state to solve problems it doesn't solve. The only world we can imagine is one where authority makes all the rules for us. We've lost the agency we had as free people, so the only solutions we can think of require the intervention of a strong leader in his huge brain. We turn to leaders when we're alienated from ourselves and each other. We can't live our full self thanks to money, property, and laws. And we can't spend as much time with others as we like thanks to jobs, borders, and all the other obligations thrown our way. So when we see someone with lots of money and power, they look like they can do anything. And we admire that because we don't have the same options. Due in large part to the natures of capitalism and nationalism, we're taught to compete with one another. Nationalist ideology divides us into countries we believe represent us somehow. So when we're told the country gained something, we're supposed to celebrate. 
Under capitalism, we're taught that competition makes us better and drives the economy and keeps prices down and all kinds of great stuff. If we lived in a cooperative society where power was shared equally, my wins could be everyone's wins because I could share good harvests, discoveries, ideas, and so on without having less than I needed. But our society is a competitive one. As systems of hierarchy, capitalism and nationalism are zero-sum games. And if there's any kind of surplus, it goes to the owners instead of being shared. The supposed gains for the country from some court case or trade agreement might just go to some corporation, which might not translate to any gain for me whatsoever, but someone from the same country gained. And I'm supposed to be happy about that. So we learn there's an incentive to compete in everything, first on teams for fun, but then as workers for jobs and sales and promotions, and as countries, both in harmless sports and in much less fun activities. Fall in with the wrong crowd and you might start believing history is about competition among races. You know, the distinctions people made up to justify enslaving people who look different. Races. Getting taught to think we're in competition with everyone else waters the ground for the strong leader. Strong leaders excel at painting a picture of a violent world only they can protect you from. From strongmen again. From the start, authoritarians stand out from other kinds of politicians by appealing to negative experiences and emotions. They don the cloak of national victimhood, reliving the humiliations of their people by foreign powers as they proclaim themselves their nation's saviors. Picking up on powerful resentments, hopes, and fears, they present themselves as the vehicle for obtaining what is most wanted, whether it's territory, safety from racial others, securing male authority, or payback for exploitation by internal or external enemies. Again, I hope that sounded familiar. Like everything else we're indoctrinated to believe, some people are convinced this drive to compete and win and defeat others is all just human nature, as if politics, economics, media, and school had no influence on us, and we're just living raw in nature. But the evidence would suggest otherwise. When kids are competing against each other in self-directed play, there's rarely much bitterness because there's so little difference between the teams. They're randomly chosen with fluid membership for a game that's purely for fun. They make and enforce their own rules, which might change as the game goes along. Maybe to make it easier or harder, maybe to include people who are better or worse at the game. The game depends on consensus, so players accommodate each other's different abilities so everyone is happy. From the book Free to Learn, you don't run full force into second base if the second baseman is smaller than you and might get hurt, even though it might be considered good strategy in Little League, where in fact a coach might scold you for not running as hard as possible. This attitude is why children are injured less frequently in informal games than in formal sports, despite parents' beliefs that adult-directed sports are safer. If they're just having fun, kids don't do anything and everything it takes to win, so they don't get hurt as much. The play is the purpose. However, when they start playing in formal leagues organized by their parents, winning becomes the purpose. Kids learn rules are fixed, made and enforced by authority, with no regard for individual differences in skill. They learn they have opponents who need to be defeated so they can feel proud and please authority. Competition's not some powerful, innate drive. Adults tell kids they want to win. Some parents encourage just about any kind of behavior in the name of winning. You can lecture all you want about having fun and so-called good sportsmanship, but it's not likely to sink in because the only apparent goal in formal sports is to win. So if you're not good enough, you're not invited to play. So don't. You don't have to compete to play. Fun doesn't have to take a backseat to winning, and in fact some of the best games are cooperative, like working together to finish a task before the time runs out. But only competing will you grow up to be a real man. Are you a strong man? Do you dominate the people in your life like a strong man should? If not, you need to take my alpha male boot camp. 
How to be the man everyone fears. Only alphas can protect the weak. Don't you love your family enough to protect them? Only $25,000 and you can do push-ups and get yelled at by me, a real man. Understanding capitalism is fundamental to understanding what a country is, because pretty much all countries nowadays are part of a capitalist empire, which is why they're all structured pretty much the same. Along with economic and legal systems, capitalism imposes value systems. Early capitalism drew a sharp line between men and women, so men could go out and earn their daily pizza crust, and women could stay at home and have the babies. From birth, girls were taught to be modest and generally feel guilty about everything, while boys were taught to create conflicts and resolve them with violence. They were taught competition was natural and learning to be warlike was good, so they would fight in imperial wars. You know, for glory or whatever. I think glory means winning in arbitrary contests you make up including the ultimate contest, war. If you can win in a contest, you can prove you're tough or skilled, even that you're the best. Why does it matter? Well, it doesn't. But you'll be a real man. Learning to compete as kids can make us insecure our whole lives, as we're always chasing the feeling of being better than others, instead of being content. We're supposed to be better, to be able to beat the other guy, to always be proving ourselves. And if we aren't, we're not enough of a man by other people's standards. And when we're under pressure to succeed against fierce competition, we resort to rumors, backstabbing, bullying, racism, anything to even the odds. Win or lose, competition is not good for your relationships or mental health. But half the time you get a short-lived warm feeling inside. People who accumulate power might get that feeling every time they succeed at something, from a convincing speech to a photo op to crushing an enemy. But so do their supporters. Because we can live vicariously through others, our ruler's strength feels like our strength. It isn't, of course, because we aren't the ones making the decisions. And rulers will eliminate even the most devoted followers if it serves their interest. But if we want to believe, the strong leader is a reflection of my country, my identity. Let me read out these toots. And by the way, it's Mastodon. They're called toots. The urge to follow an authoritarian leader is out of a desire for vicarious strength. I'm tough because I follow a tough leader. This extends into every aspect of people's lives. They buy products with a tough guy image. Tactical baby carrier and diaper bag, anyone? In this worldview, everything becomes transactional. It becomes a zero-sum game, where what matters is besting your opponent. One example of this is in the right-wing obsession with crime and guns. As YouTube gun guy Paul Harrell said, They'll go out and spend thousands on ammo and hundreds of hours at the range, but I can't get them to spend five bucks to change the batteries in their smoke detector. Because getting killed by a criminal is getting pwned. And even though that's highly unlikely, it's worse than dying in a fire. So as long as we're trying to be tougher than the next guy, we will be insecure as men. Which, historically, has led to the deaths of countless people. Because strong is so vague, a lot of men take it to mean controlling. Because it's all in the name of protecting the weak. Content warning for the next 30 seconds or so for mentioning SA and CSA. Depending which media you follow, it might not have escaped your notice recently that huge numbers of Republicans, MAGAs, Nazis, police, and other assorted patriots have been getting arrested for harassment, abuse, and rape, especially of a minor, and possessing child abuse images. And other right-wingers rush to defend them. Of course, I can provide links if you want, and there's a couple in the description already, but you could look it up yourself. It happens every week, if not every day. So if you follow some kind of media every day, why don't you know? Anyway, why would it be these guys, these right-wing authoritarian types, engaging in these most disgusting and unforgivable of acts so disproportionately to the wider population? 
Well, there are a couple of reasons. The purpose of right-wing ideology is to accumulate power. These guys know they can do it by projecting, railing against the groomers to distract people from the real groomers. But more to the point, to these guys, power includes power over the body. They want to be able to dominate, not just mentally, but physically, people who can't resist and can't tell anyone. Sometimes the cruelty of the punishment is the point. I don't want to get too deep into this connection in this video, partly because the words I would have to use would drive this video's reach into the sand, but as always, there's a link in the description. Naturally, the same authoritarian types don't want to teach young people about sex. They want control of other people's bodies. When kids don't learn about sex and consent and red flags, they're ripe for abuse. Of course, the same people want to criminalize abortion and contraception. It's more control over women's bodies. Well, that and more workers for the labor pool in 15 years' time. They assume a woman's job is to have kids and take care of her husband, and that's it. They relegate spousal and child abuse to the private sphere, so men can decide how to treat their wives and kids. When women are too assertive about their rights, like over abortion, it gets criminalized to such an extent, the Republican states began erecting a surveillance state to enforce it the minute the federal ban was lifted. And as I explain here, all this has happened before. Even right-wing women have discovered that right-wing men don't respect women. Right-wing women use right-wing nonsense to gain power over others. Well, men use it to gain power over all the same people as women do, plus over women too. Listen to people when they tell you who they are. If they're excusing, excusing and dismissing news of another man's abuses, it might mean they want to get away with the same behavior. The example many of us know about is Steven Crowder. Crowder complained that his wife could divorce him. He considers his family his property, and no one likes to give up their property. He wanted someone he could treat like a slave, even when she was pregnant and had other stuff to do, because he wanted the upper hand, which, since he has no moral authority, requires asserting one's natural authority as a man. I know not all of you have seen that leaked, vote, that leaked video of Crowder and his wife arguing, but if you did, did you notice this guy with millions of dollars only has one car? That's so he can decide where his wife goes, what she does, and who she sees. So the strong man has to be in charge, and the subservient wife kneels next to him. If the husband abuses the wife, it's all part of maintaining this relationship. These are the people who want more laws, more police, more prisons, more authority, more conformity to their way of thinking, while using languages that expresses the opposite, like freedom and love. Because when your goal is power, you can't be honest, or you'll never get it. Lasting happiness doesn't lie in holding power and scoring minor wins over other people. If you care about your own and others' happiness, then let go. Stop trying to control. Stop thinking everything's a competition. Stop thinking you or someone like you needs to be in charge. The best people to make decisions are the ones most directly affected by them. Just let people be free and they'll figure it out. But try telling that to these right-wingers. They want everyone who isn't a white man to live in terror of white men. A world where abusers are empowered and never held accountable. The strong leader embodies the image of the strong man. Tough, uncompromising, virile, a winner. They gain power by appealing to prejudices and fighting enemies that other strong leaders before them created. They promise swift and deadly justice to anyone who dares break their laws in the name of defending the weak. They exploit and control everything and everyone they can for their own benefit and think that as strong men, they deserve it. They often have a lot of charm, as you have to, to get other people to follow you. I can tell you what to do, and you can tell me to go to hell. But if I dress nice, smile, look them in the eyes, and say the right words, some people will follow me into hell. 
Sometimes the only reason we like someone is because they're charming. You can tell when that is if you don't actually know much about the person beyond their words, and you don't want to know about anything that would make them look bad. At some point, people just decide they're going to admire and support this person, so truth doesn't really matter anymore. Charming, rich, and powerful people tend to get a lot of airtime. If we see them in interviews or TED Talks or some other format designed to burnish their image, we might start describing them with the same words we keep hearing for them, like genius and strong leader. The great leaders and great thinkers and TED Talk entrepreneurs often get called geniuses and paragons of philanthropy and other virtues for what they appear to do because they know how to create an image. If you want to stop fawning over rich and powerful people to see beyond image and talk about them realistically, bear in mind two basic things about all of them. First, they own everything and extract rent from the rest of us. Anyone can do that. It takes no knowledge or effort or merit to do that. Owning things mean people need to work for you, which makes you wealthy. Wealthy people can give millions of dollars away and appear as generous and kind when they're probably just trying to avoid taxes. Second, other people do the work of making them rich and supporting their power. Whether you're thinking about the great men of history or the business gurus of our time, ask yourself how many slaves, servants, and employees they had. Because if you had thousands of employees, it wouldn't be hard for you to make money. If you had servants doing all your work for you, you'd be able to spend as much time as you wanted contemplating and creating or whatever you want. There's nothing more genius about any rich person you can name than the people who shine their shoes. One has money and therefore has all the freedom in the world, and the other is forced to work at whatever they can to survive. That says absolutely nothing about intelligence or any source of greatness. Statespeople, like all the great men of history, have entire militaries at their disposal. If three or five hundred years ago I told other people to conquer somewhere, massacre half the people, and forcibly assimilate the other half, I would be known today as Chris the First, great leader and strategist, the hero who united my people. If today I ordered people to invade and occupy part of the world with all the devastation that came with it, I would get called a leader who made a tough decision but ultimately did what I thought was right for my country. Who cares if half the people hate me? I can't hear them over my helicopter taking me to my speaking gig at Goldman Sachs. So maybe it's time to stop believing greatness is something only a few people are capable of. That strong leaders contribute something rather than just taking. That it's correct that a few people have all the wealth and make all the decisions. That there's any reason someone would deserve to have power over you. We don't need strong leaders. We need the freedom to solve our problems together.